Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer, and today there is dramatic wind and gales blowing across the southeast, and I think pretty much across most of England at the moment. So I'm not out and about as I record this. I've decided that I can't get out into the landscape, but today I will talk about the landscape. In fact, I noticed that somebody had made the comment that my channel uh, in recent times is less about heritage, landscape and nature. And uh, that may be true in certain elements, and I will address that in a different video. Um, but I do try to bring as much of that as I can as I make a video every day, and it's not always possible um, to do that. But I am today because I want to talk about this remarkable book that I am slowly um, reading, and I'm nearly at the end, but um, I will probably return to this theme several times because I think it's very important, and I think it's something that we should reflect on if, by we, I refer to people who are, um, what should I say, interested and uh, want to protect this country that we live in and or concerned for its future. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. So the book is The English Landscape in the 20th Century by Trevor Rowley or Rowley. It was published in 2006 and I'll leave a link below if you are interested in purchasing it and having a read. I do highly recommend it. It is a book that I have read slowly um, because it's it's quite a difficult read really if you ha have a love of the country and are not that keen <laughs> on many of the changes that have happened. Um, and we'll come to that. But I have found myself reading this and weeping, actually weeping at uh, what has happened. And that's why I want to share it. Now, I've made some notes, um, which I will refer to. So please excuse me doing that. And really in this video, I just want to address or examine and pull apart the very first paragraph on chapter one. So chapter one is called The English Landscape and it's just one smallish paragraph in which I found so powerful that I, I wanted to um, talk about it and, and what it means. So the first line that uh, Trevor Rowley says is the English landscape at the beginning of the 21st century owes more to the previous hundred years than any previous age. And so what he means, and he's talking about what man has done to the landscape. So we're not talking about the fact that there was um, earth movements and that uh, the, the sea receded and land volcano er eruption and all of that. He's talking about really once all that has happened and that man is settling in this country, that the changes that have happened in the last hundred years are dramatically more than what has happened in the last 10,000 years, including the Neolithic people and the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, even with the Romans and the Saxons and the Normans and then later into uh, the Middle Ages and the, so on up until, um, up until the beginning of the 21st century. The last hundred years have been the dr most dramatic change. He says in the next uh, line, he says, much has been built on the previous framework but what we see today owes little or nothing to what went on before. And what he means by that is while we have progressed from the farming community and subsistence farming um, and small scale uh, industry, uh, such as the blacksmiths and the markets and local producing of food, 
that what we now see is, is almost so significantly different that it almost has nothing really to do with how we used to do things for generation after generation, for century after century. He says the landscape is no longer directly linked to the land on which it sits. I find this a very penetrating line, sentence. The landscape no longer directly is linked to the land on which it sits. If you travel around the countryside and ignore all modern buildings and things and purely look at older buildings, you will see that the landscape was built up from buildings that took their material from that local area. So in Sussex, of course, we have flint and chalk and there would have been oak trees and beech trees and so forth, which would have made up our barns and farmyards and our houses and even our hovels to a certain degree. If you go to, I don't know, the Cotswolds, for example, you'll see that the landscape and the buildings is very different and elliptic limestone is used to make the houses because that was more plentiful and so on and so on. We, we owe the landscape to the incredible and unique geology that England has as well as Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. But although I'm talking specifically about England, but they're very similar that as you travel about, the landscape just changes and, and the building materials and the houses and all of that is so, so different. However, since the last hundred years, that is not something that we see on anymore. Uh, he, he says the local building materials or local craft traditions play little part in reshaping the environment. So going into the future, the local thing, the, the crafts that we used to have, as well as the building materials as I've just spoken about, but the, the smaller crafts, the, the blacksmith, the thatcher, the candlestick maker, the baker, um, all those sort of little local businesses that supported the rural communities and even in the towns and the local markets that people would go to to find out their local news and get the gossip and the administration, the local administration and the, uh, how things were metered out and the law um, and all of that is no longer um, something that happens, those traditions no longer, um, as he says, reshape our environment going forward. An expression that I don't like very much. He then goes on to say that most of what has been built in the last hundred years is functional and uniform. And that's so true. We know that things now, and unlike in the past with Although the timber framed houses were functional, um, they had a, an aesthetic to them. There was a natural beauty. With Georgian architecture, and some will argue Victorian architecture, although you know others will say Victorian architecture is overly fussy, but or even Queen Anne architecture, there was an aesthetic, there was a beauty to it that people enjoyed looking at these marvellous buildings that were being erected. At our churches that had come from the Norman times, or earlier than that in the Saxon times, but principally the Norman times, and that had been developed and changed, there was beauty and admiration and pride in our buildings. Now, as he says, they are functional and uniform, so that wherever you go, these great big distribution warehouses, no longer made from the local materials, but can be transported on road networks or on rail, are out of sheet metal. And they are utilitarian and ugly. We have somehow gone down the route of 
the uglification of England. And it's regrettable, I think. Um, he, he sums this paragraph up with the loss of distinctive local environment is the price to be paid for affluence, safety and cheap commodities. So we're paying that price of having our Netflix accounts, our tablets and um, iPads and laptops and phones, our um, internet and electricity, the gas and central heating, our police services, our fire brigades um, and, and our road system, uh, the ability to have food delivered to your door at the stroke of a, a swipe on a phone um, is, is one of the prices that we're paying for the loss of that distinctive local environment that made our environment unique. And finally he says, perhaps landscape in the historical sense of the evolving rural and urban scene is dead. And I think that's true, that landscape in the historical sense of its evolving, how it evolved with the market towns and the local farms and mixed farming and providing food and services in a very local way and the, the sort of um, limited transportation that you had um, that didn't overly affect the landscape. That's gone. That's gone. And I conclude on this or respond to this paragraph that, well, we live now in the here and now in the in the 21st century or and so the the last hundred years, many of us were born in that century, some perhaps watching this uh, very young would have been born in this century, the 21st century, but most probably watching were born in the 20th century and it was already evolving and happening and we just take that as for granted. We don't have that living memory ourselves of what it was like pre-1900. We were not old enough to know that. And so we demand a certain standard of living now. It's expected that we have the central heating and our internet and electricity and all these services that I've mentioned. And I don't think that we see the cost of that. And I would go further to say that we don't even appreciate that there is a cost for all of that. Because in a way, because we're living in it here and now, I just don't think that we, we see the expanding urban areas. We hear a little bit about, oh, they're building some houses in this plot of land over here and they're, and they're building a little bit over there and there's a, a, a small protest here or they're building HS2 and it's going through a bit of ancient forest. But, you know, the, the links will be so much better. It'll be so much faster. We sort of almost, and this is a sweeping statement, I appreciate, but we almost just except that is the norm and that is okay. Um, we don't really see the lack of those small local mixed farms because we really and truly now we don't have them and haven't had them and we don't really miss and know the importance of having had local farms that used to supply the towns and the villages with local fresh produce that was grown in their environment, that was pollinated by local insects. We don't, we don't really notice that anymore. We don't see the increased monoculture, that farms, we just expect them to be these vast fields. We, we haven't really experienced the, the smaller farms and the smaller fields that we see in the old films with wide hedgerows. We, we don't really have a knowledge anymore 
of walking across meadow after meadow of wild flowers with such a plethora of different varieties of flowers with a whole host of um, insects leaping about and enjoying those wild flowers pollinating everything. We no longer see that and even understand that as ever being a thing. Uh, uh, we consequently, we don't really notice the demise in the wildlife and the nature because we, we're so disconnected from it anymore. We don't have that knowledge of what tree is which, what wild flower is that, what mammal is over there. We're so disconnected from all of that, from the landscape. It's just a place that we go to for a walk now, a place that we go to for leisure. We're not involved in it. It's not somewhere where we actually live shoulder by shoulder, cheek by jowl with the nature and the lands and, and um, the, the nature and the nature and the wildlife. It's, it's, we, we don't really even notice anymore the increasing uh, crisscrossing of the country with all these transport links that bring us all the stuff and the goods that we want. We, we are, however, it seems, obsessed with things like global warming or even a pandemic. We're obsessed with that, but we're not that concerned about globalization and the mass industrialization of our landscape. We don't seem to care about that. Now, I'm not saying that any of this is right or wrong as such because I don't really know. I'm, I'm here too. I'm living in this environment as well. And I don't know if it's right or wrong that we have got to where we are because, you, you know, I cannot sit here and be a hypocrite. Well, I can, of course I can. I drive a van. I make digital videos which expresses my concern. I, I, I lament the loss of the very thing that has made England, England. I lament the loss of our landscape and that what we see now, although still beautiful in many ways and still enriching and in small pockets has something magical about it, but is nothing like the world that people like Richard Jeffries W.H. Hudson would have walked across and enjoyed and would have been a marvellous place. I lament that so much has changed and I worry that if we don't stop, there'll be nothing for our children and our children's children. And that is just summing up the first paragraph of Trevor Rowley or Rowley, this book. It's, it is something that has made me weep, as I said, and I recommend reading it and thinking about how much we really need and what the cost is to our landscape. Thank you for watching. Slightly different, a bit more emotional from me, but I think it's important. Don't forget to follow, like, subscribe, become a patron and support what I do. And when the wind and the rain and the adverse weather changes, I will be back out and exploring what we have here in the 21st century to look at and those elements of, her of um, historic interest, our heritage. Till then, bye-bye.